In April, Colossal Biosciences announced what sounded like science fiction, the return of the direwolf. The announcement captured imaginations worldwide. But what's the reality behind the spectacle? What does it really mean to bring back an extinct species? And how close are we truly to de-extinction? In this video, I'm going to be breaking down the science of de-extinction, how it works, where we are now, and what the recent direwolf announcement tells us about the possibilities and limitations of this rapidly evolving field. De-extinction refers to the process of recreating traits or lineages of species that have gone extinct, using modern genetic tools like CRISPR, cloning and synthetic biology. Projects involving the woolly mammoth, thylacine and dodo are all examples of this approach, and the idea has captured the public imagination especially with companies like Colossal Biosciences pushing this frontier forward. So what did Colossal actually do? Well, they announced the birth of three genetically modified wolf pups, Romulus, Remus and Khaleesi, claiming they'd successfully de-extincted the direwolf. So here's what they did. They identified 14 genes from ancient direwolf DNA linked to traits like skull shape, body size and coat colour. They edited those genes into grey wolf cells, the modified cells were cloned and implanted into domestic dog surrogates and then the pups were born healthy via planned caesarean section. However, over 99% of their genome is still that of a grey wolf. These aren't dire wolves, they're genetically modified wolves with a few dire wolf-like features. So importantly, no actual ancient DNA was spliced into their genome. It's a remarkable technical achievement, but it's important to clarify what it is and what it isn't. The resulting animals are genetically modified grey wolves with some direwolf-like traits. They're not full reconstructions of a direwolf. Direwolves diverged from grey wolves 2.5 to 6 million years ago, and they're not even in the same genus. In fact, the lineage that direwolves emerged from was closer to modern-day African jackals than grey wolves. Despite popular portrayals, the real direwolf likely looks quite different from the creatures imagined by both Colossal Biosciences and Game of Thrones. In reality, direwolves were not oversized, husky-like beasts with thick white fur, but rather stockier, shorter-legged canids with broader skulls and heavier jaws, adapted for bone crushing and ambushing prey rather than long chases. Their build was much more robust than modern grey wolves. While Game of Thrones presents direwolves as massive loyal companions the size of small horses, and Colossal's genetically modified wolves appear more like light-coated grey wolves with a few edited traits, these versions stray from fossil-based reconstructions. The real direwolf was a formidable predator of the Pleistocene, and not the pale, arctic-styled beast pop culture would have us believe. It's the equivalent of cloning an orangutan tweaking a few genes to reduce its body hair, increase brain size, and maybe reshape its face, and then announcing, we brought back a human. Sounds absurd, right? And that's essentially what's happening here. Dire wolves and grey wolves may look superficially similar, but genetically, they're as distinct as humans are from orangutans. Editing a few surface level traits like skull shape or coat color doesn't recreate a species. It creates a look-alike, not the original. So while Colossal's achievement is technically impressive, calling it de-extinction is more marketing than science. Ancient DNA, while extremely valuable, is often too degraded to fully sequence or clone. So this is why they identified specific genetic regions that are likely to have influenced traits in the extinct species. So that's what they've done. They've synthesized traits, not species. They don't conform to the IUCN guidelines for proxy species and they have no current ecosystem niche. Colossal biologist Dr. Beth Shapiro explained that the goal is not to recreate the exact genome, but to introduce physical and possibly behavioural traits through targeted editing, creating what we might call a functional analogue. This is fair, but considering the way that the announcement was presented, it does seem a bit misleading. So one of the reasons that the announcement drew so much attention was its presentation. It was accompanied by high-profile media coverage landing on the cover of Time magazine complete with dramatic wolf imagery. There were exclusive interviews with major outlets, YouTube promos, endorsements from public figures, and even a short video featuring the first dire wolf howls in 10,000 years. This kind of visibility brings exciting science into the public eye, but it can also create confusion. Some headlines implied that the dire wolf had literally returned when in fact these are genetically modified grey wolves, engineered to express a handful of direwolf-like traits. 
For those of us in science communication, this presents a challenge. How do we engage the public with emerging technologies while still clearly defining what's been achieved and what hasn't? Because when the storytelling is too good, it can overshadow the science itself. While the media spotlight was firmly on the so-called direwolves, Glossal was also promoting something that they framed as a breakthrough in conservation, the successful cloning of four red wolves, a critically endangered species native to the southeastern United States. And at first glance, this sounds like a huge win. With fewer than 20 red wolves left in the wild, new genetic founders could, in theory, help restore diversity to a fragile population teetering on the edge. But according to experts on the ground, the reality is much more complicated. Dr. Joseph Hinton, senior research scientist at the Wolf Conservation Centre, argues that cloning is a solution in search of a problem, and that the real threats to red wolves are not genetic. The human cause mortality, getting shot, hit by cars, or displaced from their habitat. Not only that, but the animals cloned by Colossal may not actually be red wolves. They were likely derived from coyotes captured in southwest Louisiana as part of the Gulf Coast Canid project. Dr. Hinton himself captures some of the very animals that may have provided the genetic material. And in his own words, I've yet to capture anything that even approaches a red wolf from that area. In other words, the cloned animals may resemble red wolves superficially, but they're not genetically representative of the true red wolf population. Meanwhile, over 270 genetically verified red wolves already exist in captive breeding programs, and they're ready to be reintroduced into the wild. They just need space, support, and protection. The science of cloning is fascinating, but it's not what the red wolf truly needs. What it needs is policy change, new release sites, public support, and protection from bullets. So while the cloned cannons may generate headlines, the real conservation heroes are the researchers, caretakers and communities working to protect the wolves that already exist. While the wolf announcement made headlines, it's only one piece of a much larger puzzle. Colossal Biosciences is simultaneously working on several ambitious projects to bring back, or reconstruct, other extinct species. Take the woolly mammoth for example. Rather than trying to clone frozen DNA, Colossal is editing key mammoth genes, such as those for thick fur, cold resistance and fat storage, into the genome of the Asian elephant, its closest living relative. The result will likely be a hybrid, sometimes dubbed a mammophan, that could potentially roam the Arctic tundra to help restore the grassland ecosystem. Then there's the thylacine or Tasmanian tiger, a marsupial predator that vanished in the 20th century. Colossal is partnering with researchers in Australia to reconstruct its genome using preserved specimens and marsupial surrogates like the Dunart. They've even built an artificial womb prototype for marsupials, a world first. Their dodo project focuses on the extinct flightless bird from Mauritius, using ancient DNA and the genome of its closest living relative, the Nicobar pigeon. They aim to breed a dodo proxy through genetic editing and avian surrogate techniques. And perhaps the most ambitious of all, the Stella's sea cow. This gentle nine meter long marine herbivore went extinct in the 1700s. Because it lacks a suitable living surrogate, Colossal plans to develop artificial womb technology for marine mammals, a monumental challenge in itself. The closest living relative is the dugong, but differences in size and biology make traditional cloning unfeasible. The project hopes to eventually restore this keystone species to help rewild kelp forests and seagrass ecosystems along the North Pacific. Other species on Colossal's radar include the northern white rhinoceros, passenger pigeon, great auk, cave lion, and even Ice Age megafauna like the Irish elk and woolly rhino. In many cases, these efforts rely on identifying and reactivating genes from preserved specimens and inserting them into the genomes of closely related extant species, creating functional analogues rather than perfect replicas. What ties all these projects together is the same core strategy. Using modern tools like CRISPR, cloning, and induced pluripotent stem cells, to reconstruct key traits and reintroduce lost functions. While still experimental, these projects blend real genetic science with bold ecological ambitions. They raise difficult questions, but they also represent a fascinating frontier in conservation biology. Whether the goal is rewilding, public engagement, or genetic rescue, these projects all raise a critical question. Can we, and should we, use cutting edge biology to undo the past? Especially when we as a species are partly or fully responsible for many of these species' extinctions? Do we have a responsibility to fix the mistakes we've made? Or are we just risking making things worse? So, is de-extinction dangerous? 
The answer, like most things in science, is it depends. These are very real concerns. First, genes don't just control one thing. They influence many systems. Tweaking genes linked to traits like body size or coat color can have unintended effects on bone development, metabolism, immune function, or fertility. A small change might trigger major health issues. Tinkering with genomes could also create organisms that are invasive, aggressive, or outcompete native species. Yeah, but your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could, they didn't stop to think if they should. Introducing genetically altered or proxy species into modern ecosystems could have unpredictable effects, especially when those ecosystems have changed dramatically since the species originally existed. Imagine introducing a proxy predator into an ecosystem that's moved on for 10,000 years. The ripple effects could be huge. And let's not forget about the welfare of these animals. De extinction doesn't just happen in a lab. It involves cloning, gestation in surrogate species, and rearing of organisms that may suffer deformities, immune deficiencies, or poor adaptation to their environment. These aren't just experiments, they're sentient beings. And perhaps the most subtle danger, just as important, the illusion that extinction is reversible could make us complacent. If the public believes we can just bring species back, it might reduce the urgency to protect the ones we're losing right now. There's also genuine potential here. When used thoughtfully, these technologies can help restore lost genetic diversity in endangered populations, assist with species recovery by offering new tools for reproduction and disease resistance, and even support ecosystem restoration in areas where key ecological players have vanished. It all depends on how we use the tools and why. The extinction isn't inherently good or bad. Like any powerful technology, it's about intention, transparency and accountability. The extinction is no longer just science fiction, but it's also not magic. We're witnessing the early steps of a complex, evolving field. Whether or not we should bring species back is a question that needs scientific, ecological and ethical reflection. Attempts to revive extinct species go back decades, like the cloned Pyrrhini in Ibex in 2003, which survived only minutes or the gastric breeding frog whose DNA was briefly reactivated but never produced a viable animal. Even more recently, scientists cloned black-footed ferrets from cryopreserved cells to rescue endangered populations. A real science-based milestone. The problem with exaggeration or oversimplified headlines is that they distract from what's actually been achieved and what's genuinely exciting. As a scientist, I find this field thrilling. The possibilities are incredible. But as someone passionate about conservation, I also think clearer, more responsible messaging would help the cause far more, because the real science is impressive enough without needing to sell it as a Jurassic Park headline. So what do you think? Is de extinction the future of conservation? Or are we racing ahead of ourselves? Let me know in the comments, and thanks for watching.